Chapter Eight of La Ba by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Keen Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Next day, his ferment had subsided. The unknown never left him, but she kept her distance. Her less certain features were effaced in mist. Her fascination became feebler, and she no longer was his sole preoccupation. The idea, suddenly formed on a word of Des Hermies that the unknown must be chantelouve's wife had in fashion checked his fever if it was she and his contrary conclusions of the evening before seemed hardly valid when he took up one by one the arguments by which he had arrived at them then her reasons for wanting him were obscure dangerous and he was on his guard no longer letting himself go in complete self-abandon and yet there was another phenomenon taking place within him he had never paid any especial attention to hyacinthe chantelouve he had never been in love with her she interested him by the mystery of her person and her life but outside her drawing-room he had never given her a thought now ruminating about her he began almost to desire her suddenly she benefited by the face of the unknown for when durtal evoked her she came confused to his sight her physiognomy mingled with that which he had visualized when the first letters came though the sneaking scoundrelism of her husband displeased him he did not think her the less attractive but his desires were no longer beyond control in spite of the distrust which she aroused she might be an interesting mistress making up for her barefaced vices by her good grace but she was no longer the non-existent the chimera raised in a moment of uncertainty on the other hand if his conjectures were false if it was not madame chantelouve who had written the letters then the other the unknown lost a little of her subtlety by the mere fact that she could be incarnated in a creature whom he knew still remote she became less so then her beauty deteriorated because in turn she took on certain features of madame chantelouve and if the latter had profited the former on the contrary lost by the confusion which durtal had established in one as in the other case whether she were madame chantelouve or not he felt appeased calmed at heart he did not know when he revolved the adventure whether he preferred his chimera even diminished or this hyacinthe who at least in her reality was not a disenchanting frump wrinkled with age he profited by the respite to get back to work but he had presumed too much upon his powers when he tried to begin his chapter on the crimes of gilles de Ray, he discovered that he was incapable of sewing two sentences together he wandered in pursuit of the marshal and caught up with him but the prose in which he wished to embody the man remained listless and lifeless and he could think only patchily he threw down his pen and sank into an armchair in reverie he was transported to tiffauges where satan who had refused so obstinately to show himself now became incarnate in the unwitting marshal to wallow him vociferating in the joys of murder for this basically is what satanism is said durtal to himself the external semblance of the demon is a minor matter he has no need of exhibiting himself in human or bestial form to attest his presence for him to prove himself it is enough that he choose a domicile in souls which he ulcerates and incites to inexplicable crimes then he can hold his victims by that hope which he breathes into them that instead of living in them as he does and as they don't often know he will obey evocations appear to them and deal out duly legally the advantages he concedes in exchange for certain forfeits our very willingness to make a pact with him must be able often to produce his infusion into us all the modern theories of the followers of maudsley and lombroso do not in fact render the singular abuses of the marshal comprehensible nothing could be more just than to class him as a monomaniac for he was one if by the word monomaniac we designate every man who is dominated by a fixed idea but so is every one of us more or less from the business man all whose thoughts converge on the one idea of gain to the artist absorbed in bringing his masterpiece into the world but why was the marshal a monomaniac how did he become one that is what all the lombrosos in the world can't tell you encephalic lesions adherence of the pia mater to the cerebrum mean absolutely nothing in this question for they are simple resultants effects derived from a cause which ought to be explained and which no materialist can explain it is easy to declare that a disturbance of the cerebral lobes produces assassins and demonomaniacs the famous alienists of our time claim that analysis of the brain of an insane woman disclosed a lesion or a deterioration of the grey matter and suppose it did 
would still be a question whether in the case of a woman possessed with demonomania the lesion produced the demonomania or the demonomania produced the lesion admitting that there was a lesion the spiritual comprachicos have never resorted to cerebral surgery they don't amputate the lobes supposed to be reliably identified after carefully trepanning they simply act upon the pupil by inculcating ignoble ideas in him developing his bad instincts pushing him little by little into the paths of vice and if this gymnastic of persuasion deteriorates the cerebral tissues in the subject that proves precisely that the lesion is only the derivative and not the cause of the psychological state and then and then these doctrines which consist nowadays in confounding the criminal with the insane the demonomaniac with the mad have absolutely no foundation nine years ago a lad of fourteen felix le maire assassinated a little boy whom he did not know he just wanted to see the child suffer just wanted to hear him cry felix slashed the little fellow's stomach with a knife turned the blade round and round in the warm flesh then slowly sawed his victim's head off felix manifested no remorse and in the ensuing investigation proved himself to be intelligent and atrocious dr le grand du sol and other specialists kept him under vigilant surveillance for months and could not discover the slightest pathological symptom and he had had fairly good rearing and certainly had not been corrupted by others his behaviour was like that of the conscious or unconscious demonomaniacs who do evil for evil's sake they are no more mad than the rapt monk in his cell than the man who does good for good's sake anybody but a medical theorist can see that the desire for good and the desire for evil simply form the two opposing poles of the soul in the fifteenth century these extremes were represented by jeanne d'arc and the marshal de ray now there is no more reason for attributing madness to gilles than there is for attributing it to jeanne d'arc whose admirable excesses certainly have no connection with vesania and delirium all the same some frightful nights must have been passed in that fortress said durtal he was thinking of the chateau de tiffauges which he had visited a year ago believing that it would aid him in his work to live in the country where gilles had lived and to dig among the ruins he had established himself in the little hamlet which stretches along the base of the abandoned donjon he learned what a living thing the legend of bluebeard was in this isolated part of la vendee on the border of brittany he was a young man who came to a bad end said the young women more fearful their grandmothers crossed themselves as they went along the foot of the wall in the evening the memory of the disemboweled children persisted the marshal known only by his surname still had the power to terrify durtal had gone every day from the inn where he lodged to the chateau towering over the valleys of the crume and of the sevres facing hills excoriated with blocks of granite and overgrown with formidable oaks whose roots protruding out of the ground resembled monstrous nests of frightened snakes one might have believed oneself transported into the real brittany there was the same melancholy heavy sky the same sun which seemed older than in other parts of the world and which but feebly gilded the sorrowful age-old forests and the mossy sandstone there were the same endless stretches of broken rocky soil pitted with ponds of rusty water dotted with scattered clumps of gorse and fruze copse and sprinkled with pink harebells and nameless yellow prairie flowers one felt that this iron-grey sky this starving soil empurpled only here and there by the bleeding flower of the buckwheat that these roads bordered with stones placed one on top of the other without cement or plaster that these paths bordered with impenetrable hedges that these grudging plants these inhospitable fields these crippled beggars eaten with vermin plastered with filth that even the flocks undersized and wasted the dumpy little cows the black sheep whose blue eyes had the cold pale gleam that is in the eyes of the slav or of the tribard had perpetuated their primordial state preserving an identical landscape through all the centuries except for an incongruous factory chimney further away on the bank of the sevres the countryside of tiffauges remained in perfect harmony with the immense chateau erect among its ruins within the close still to be traced by the ruins of the towers was a whole plain now converted into a miserable truck garden cabbages in long bluish lines impoverished carrots consumptive navues spread over this enormous circle where iron mail had clanked in the tournament and where processionals had slowly devolved in the smoke of incense to the chanting of psalms a thatched hut had been built in a corner the peasant inhabitants returned to a state of savagery no longer understood the meaning of words 
and could be roused out of their apathy only by the display of a silver coin seizing the coin they would hand over the keys for hours one could browse around at ease among the ruins and smoke and daydream unfortunately certain parts were inaccessible the donjon was still shut off on the tifauge side by a vast moat at the bottom of which mighty trees were growing one would have had to pass over the tops of the trees growing to the very verge of the wall to gain a porch on the other side for there was now no drawbridge but quite accessible was another part which overhung the sevre there the wings of the castle overgrown with ivy and white-crested viburnum were intact spongy dry as pumice stone silvered with lichen and gilded with moss the towers rose entire though from their crenellated collarettes whole blocks were blown away on windy nights within room succeeded glacial room cut into the granite surmounted with vaulted roofs and as close as the hold of a ship then by spiral stairways one descended into similar chambers joined by cellar passageways into the walls of which were dug deep niches and layers of unknown utility beneath those corridors so narrow that two persons could not walk along them abreast descended at a gentle slope and bifurcated so that there was a labyrinth of lanes leading to veritable cells on the walls of which the nitre scintillated in the light of the lantern like steel mica or twinkling grains of sugar in the cells above in the dungeons beneath one stumbled over rifts of hard earth in the centre or in a corner of which yawned now the mouth of an unsealed oubliette now a well finally at the summit of one of the towers that at the left as one entered there was a roofed gallery running parallel to a circular foothold cut from the rock there without doubt the men-at-arms had been stationed to fire on their assailants through wide loopholes opening overhead and underfoot in this gallery the voice even the lowest followed the curving walls and could be heard all around the circuit briefly the exterior of the castle revealed a fortified place built to stand long sieges and the dismantled interior made one think of a prison in which flesh mildewed by the moisture must rot in a few months out in the open air again one felt a sensation of well-being of relief which one lost on traversing the ruins of the isolated chapel and penetrating by a cellar door to the crypt below this chapel low squat its vaulted roof upheld by massive columns on whose capitals lozenges and bishops croziers were carved dated from the eleventh century the altar stone survived intact brackish daylight which seemed to have been filtered through layers of horn came in at the openings hardly lighting the shadowed begrimed walls and the earth floor which too was pierced by the entrance to an oubliette or by a well shaft in the evening after dinner he had often climbed up on the embankment and followed the cracked walls of the ruins on bright nights one part of the castle was thrown back into shadow and the other by contrast stood forth washed in silver and blue as if rubbed with mercurial lustres above the sevres along whose surface streaks of moonlight darted like the backs of fishes the silence was overpowering after nine o'clock not a dog not a soul he would return to the poor chamber of the inn where an old woman in black wearing the cornet headdress her ancestors wore in the sixteenth century waited with a candle to bar the door as soon as he returned all this said durtal to himself is the skeleton of a dead keep to reanimate it we must revisualize the opulent flesh which once covered these bones of sandstone documents give us every detail this carcass was magnificently clad and if we are to see gilles in his own environment we must remember all the sumptuosity of fifteenth-century furnishing we must reclothe these walls with wainscots of irish wood or with high warp tapestries of gold and thread of arras so much sought after in that epoch then this hard black soil must be repaved with green and yellow bricks or black and white flagstones the vault must be starred with gold and sewn with crossbows on a field azure and the marshal's cross sable on shield or must be set shining there of themselves the furnishings returned each to its own place here and there were high-backed seignorial chairs thrones and stools against the walls were sideboards on whose carved panels were bas-reliefs representing the annunciation and the adoration of the magi on top of the sideboards beneath lace canopies stood the painted and gilded statues of saint anne saint marguerite and saint catherine so often reproduced by the woodcarvers of the middle ages 
there were linen chests bound in iron studded with great nails and covered with sowskin leather then there were coffers fastened by great metal clasps and overlaid with leather or fabric on which fair-faced angels cut from illuminated missile backgrounds had been mounted there were great beds reached by carpeted steps there were tasseled pillows and counterpanes heavily perfumed and canopies and curtains embroidered with armories or sprinkled with stars so one must reconstruct the decorations of the other rooms in which nothing was standing but the walls and the high basket funnelled fireplaces whose spacious hearths wanting andirons were still charred from the old fires one could easily imagine the dining rooms and those terrible repasts which gilles deplored in his trial at nantes gilles admitted with tears that he had ordered his diet so as to kindle the fury of his senses and these reprobate menus can be easily reproduced when he was at table with eustache blanchet prelati gilles de sillet and all his trusted companions in the great room the plates and the ewers filled with water of medla rose and melilote for washing the hands were placed on credences gilles ate beef salmon and brim pies levert and squab tarts roast heron stork crane peacock bustard and swan venison in verjuice nantes lampreys salads of brioni hops beard of judas mallow vehement dishes seasoned with marjoram and mace coriander and sage peony and rosemary basil and hyssop grain of paradise and ginger perfumed acidulous dishes giving one a violent thirst heavy pastries tarts of elderflower and rape rice with milk of hazelnuts sprinkled with cinnamon stuffy dishes necessitating copious draughts of beer and fermented mulberry juice of dry wine or wine aged to tannic bitterness of heady hypocras charged with cinnamon with almonds and with musk of raging liquors clouded with golden particles mad drinks which spurred the guests in this womanless castle to frenzies of lechery and made them at the end of the meal writhe in monstrous dreams remain the costumes to be restored said durtal to himself and he imagined gilles and his friends not in their damaskined field harness but in their indoor costumes their robes of peace he visualized them in harmony with the luxury of their surroundings they wore glittering vestments pleated jackets bellying out in a little flounced skirt at the waist the legs were encased in dark skin-tight hose on their heads were the artichoke chaperon hats like that of charles the seventh in his portrait in the louvre the torso was enveloped in silver-threaded damask which was crusted with jewelries and bordered with marten he thought of the costume of the women of the time robes of precious tented stuffs with tight sleeves great collars thrown back over the shoulders cramping bodices long trains lined with fur and as he thus dressed an imaginary mannequin hanging ropes of heavy stones purplish or milky crystals cloudy uncut gems over the slashed corsage a woman slipped in filled the robe swelled the bodice and thrust her head under the two-horned steeple headdress from behind the pendant lace smiled the composite features of the unknown and of madame chanteloube delighted he gazed at the apparition without ever perceiving whom he had evoked when his cat jumping into his lap distracted his thoughts and brought him back to his room well well she won't let me alone and in spite of himself he began to laugh at the thought of the unknown following him even to the chateau de tiffauge it's foolish to let my thoughts wander this way he said drawing himself up but daydream is the only good thing in life everything else is vulgar and empty no doubt about it that was a singular epoch the middle epoch of ignorance and darkness the history professors and ages he went on lighting a cigarette for some it's all white and for others utterly black no intermediate shade atheists reiterate dolorous and exquisite epoch say the artists and the religious savants what is certain is that the immutable classes the nobility the clergy the bourgeoisie the people had loftier souls at that time you can prove it society has done nothing but deteriorate in the four centuries separating us from the middle ages true a baron then was usually a formidable brute he was a drunken and lecherous bandit a sanguinary and boisterous tyrant but he was a child in mind and spirit the church bullied him and to deliver the holy sepulchre he sacrificed his wealth abandoned home wife and children and accepted unconscionable fatigues extraordinary sufferings unheard of dangers by pious heroism he redeemed the baseness of his morals the race has since become moderate 
it has reduced sometimes even done away with its instincts of carnage and rape but it has replaced them by the monomania of business the passion for lucre that has done worse it has sunk to such a state of abjectness as to be attracted by the doings of the lowest of the low the aristocracy disguises itself as a mountebank puts on tights and spangles gives public trapeze performances jumps through hoops and does weightlifting stunts in the trampled tan bark ring the clergy then a good example if we accept a few convents ravaged by frenzied satanism and lechery launched itself into superhuman transports and attained god saints swarmed miracles multiplied and while still omnipotent the church was gentle with the humble it consoled the afflicted defended the little ones and mourned or rejoiced with the people of low estate today it hates the poor and mysticism dies in a clergy which checks ardent thoughts and preaches sobriety of mind continence of postulation common sense in prayer bourgeoisie of the soul yet here and there buried in cloisters far from these lukewarm priests there perhaps still are real saints who weep monks who pray to the point of dying of sorrow and prayer for each of us and they with the demoniacs are the sole connecting link between that age and this the smug sententious side of the bourgeoisie already existed in the time of charles the seventh but cupidity was repressed by the confessor and the tradesman just like the labourer was maintained by the corporations which denounced overcharging and fraud saw that decried merchandise was destroyed and fixed a fair price and a high standard of excellence for commodities trades and professions were handed down from father to son the corporations assured work and pay people were not as now subject to the fluctuations of the market and the merciless capitalistic exploitation great fortunes did not exist and everybody had enough to live on sure of the future unhurried they created marvels of art whose secret remains forever lost all the artisans who passed the three degrees of apprentice journeyman and master developed subtlety and became veritable artists they ennobled the simplest of ironwork the commonest faience the most ordinary chests and coffers those corporations putting themselves under the patronage of saints whose images frequently besought figured on their banners preserved through the centuries the honest existence of the humble and notably raised the spiritual level of the people whom they protected all that is decisively at an end the bourgeoisie has taken the place forfeited by a wastrel nobility which now subsists only to set ignoble fashions and whose sole contribution to our civilization is the establishment of gluttonous dining clubs so-called gymnastic societies and pari mutual associations today the business man has but these aims to exploit the working man manufacture shoddy lie about the quality of merchandise and give short weight as for the people they have been relieved of the indispensable fear of hell and notified at the same time that they are not to expect to be recompensed after death for their sufferings here so they scamp their ill-paid work and take to drink from time to time when they have ingurgitated two violent liquids they revolt and then they must be slaughtered for once let loose they would act as a crazed stampeded herd good god what a mess and to think that the nineteenth century takes on airs and adulates itself there is one word in the mouths of all progress progress of whom progress of what for this miserable century hasn't invented anything great it has constructed nothing and destroyed everything at the present hour it glorifies itself in this electricity which it thinks it discovered but electricity was known and used in remotest antiquity and if the ancients could not explain its nature nor even its essence the moderns are just as incapable of identifying that force which conveys the spark and carries the voice acutely nasalized along the wire this century thinks it discovered the terrible science of hypnotism which the priests and brahmins in egypt and india knew and practised to the utmost now the only thing this century has invented is the sophistication of products therein it is past master it has even gone so far as to adulterate excrement yes in eighteen eighty eight the two houses of parliament had to pass a law destined to suppress the falsification of fertilizer now that's the limit the doorbell rang he opened the door and nearly fell over backward madame chantelouve was before him stupefied he bowed while madame chantelouve without a word went straight into the study there she turned around and durtal who had followed found himself face to face with her 
would you please sit down he advanced an armchair and hastened to push back with his foot the edge of the carpet turned up by the cat he asked her to excuse the disorder she made a vague gesture and remained standing in a calm but very low voice she said it is i who wrote you those mad letters i have come to drive away this bad fever and get it over with in a quite frank way as you yourself wrote no liaison between us is possible let us forget what has happened and before i go tell me that you bear me no grudge he cried out at this he would not have it so he had not been beside himself when he wrote her those ardent pages he was in perfectly good faith he loved her you love me why you didn't even know that those letters were from me you loved an unknown a chimera well admitting that you are telling the truth the chimera does not exist now for here i am you are mistaken i knew perfectly that it was madame chanteloube hiding behind the pseudonym of madame maubel and he half explained to her without of course letting her know of his doubts how he had lifted her mask ah she reflected blinking her troubled eyes at any rate she said again facing him squarely you could not have recognized me in the first letters to which you responded with cries of passion those cries were not addressed to me he contested this observation and became entangled in the dates and happenings and in the sequence of the notes she at length lost the thread of his remarks the situation was so ridiculous that both were silent then she sat down and burst out laughing her strident shrill laugh revealing magnificent but short and pointed teeth in a mocking mouth vexed him she has been playing with me he said to himself and dissatisfied with the turn the conversation had taken and furious at seeing this woman so calm so different from her burning letters he asked in a tone of irritation am i to know why you laugh pardon me it's a trick my nerves play on me sometimes in public places but never mind let us be reasonable and talk things over you tell me you love me and i mean it well admitting that i too am not indifferent where is this going to lead us oh you know so well you poor dear that you refused right at first the meeting which i asked in a moment of madness and you gave well thought out reasons for refusing but i refused because i did not know then that you were the woman in the case i have told you that it was several days later that des hermies unwittingly revealed your identity to me did i hesitate as soon as i knew no i immediately implored you to come that may be but you admit that i'm right when i claim that you wrote your first letters to another and not me she was pensive for a moment durtal began to be prodigiously bored by this discussion he thought it more prudent not to answer and was seeking a change of subject that would put an end to the deadlock she herself got him out of his difficulty let us not discuss it any more she said smiling we shall not get anywhere you see this is the situation i am married to a very nice man who loves me and whose only crime is that he represents the rather insipid happiness which one has right at hand i started this correspondence with you so i am to blame and believe me on his account i suffer you have work to do beautiful books to write you don't need to have a crazy woman come walking into your life so you see the best thing is for us to remain friends but true friends and go no further and it is the woman who wrote me such vivid letters who now speaks to me of reason good sense and god knows what but be frank now you don't love me i don't he took her hands gently she made no resistance but looking at him squarely she said listen if you had loved me you would have come to see me and yet for months you haven't tried to find out whether i was alive or dead but you understand that i could not hope to be welcomed by you on the terms we now are on and too in your parlour there are guests your husband i have never had you even a little bit to myself at your home he pressed her hands more tightly and came closer to her she regarded him with her smoky eyes in which he now saw that dolent almost dolorous expression which had captivated him he completely lost control of himself before this voluptuous and plaintive face but with a firm gesture she freed her hands enough sit down now and let's talk of something else do you know your apartment is charming which saint is that she asked examining the picture over the mantel of the monk on his knees beside a cardinal's hat and cloak i do not know i will find out for you i have the lives of all the saints at home it ought to be easy to find out about a cardinal who renounced the purple to go live in a hut 
wait i think st peter damien did but i'm not sure i have such a poor memory help me think but i don't know who he is she came closer to him and put her hand on his shoulder are you angry at me i should say i am when i desire you frantically when i've been dreaming for a whole week about this meeting you come here and tell me that all is over between us that you do not love me she became demure but if i did not love you would i have come to you understand then that reality kills a dream that it is better for us not to expose ourselves to fearful regrets we are not children you see no let me go do not squeeze me like that very pale she struggled in his embrace i swear to you that i will go away and that you shall never see me again if you do not let me loose her voice became hard she was almost hissing her words he let go of her sit down there behind the table do that for me and tapping the floor with her heel she said in a tone of melancholy then it is impossible to be friends only friends with a man but it would be very nice to come and see you without having evil thoughts to fear wouldn't it she was silent then she added yes just to see each other and if we did not have any sublime things to say to each other it is also very nice to sit and say nothing then she said my time is up i must go home and leave me with no hope he exclaimed kissing her gloved hands she did not answer but gently shook her head then as he looked pleadingly at her she said listen if you will promise to make no demands on me and to be good i will come here night after next at nine o'clock he promised whatever she wished and as he raised his head from her hands and as his lips brushed lightly over her breast which seemed to tighten she disengaged her hands caught his nervously and clenching her teeth offered her neck to his lips then she fled Oof, he said closing the door after her he was at the same time satisfied and vexed satisfied because he found her enigmatic changeful charming now that he was alone he recalled her to memory he remembered her tight black dress her fur cloak the warm collar of which had caressed him as he was covering her neck with kisses he remembered that she wore no jewellery except sparkling blue sapphire eardrops he remembered the wayward blonde hair escaping from under the dark green otter hat holding his hands to his nostrils he sniffed again the sweet and distant odour cinnamon lost among stronger perfumes which he had caught from the contact of her long fawn-coloured suede gloves and he saw again her moist rodent teeth her thin bitten lips and her troubled eyes of a grey and opaque lustre which could suddenly be transfigured with radiance oh night after next it will be great to kiss all that vexed also both with himself and with her he reproached himself with having been brusque and reserved he ought to have shown himself more expansive and less restrained but it was her fault for she had abashed him the incongruity between the woman who cried with voluptuous suffering in her letters and the woman he had seen so thoroughly mistress of herself in her coquetries was truly too much however you look at them these women are astonishing creatures he thought here is one who accomplishes the most difficult thing you can imagine coming to a man's room after having written him excessive letters i i act like a goose i stand there ill at ease she in a second has the self-assurance of a person in her own home or visiting in a drawing-room no awkwardness pretty gestures a few words and eyes which supply everything she isn't very agreeable he thought reminded of the curt tone she had used when disengaging herself and yet she has her tender spots he continued dreamily remembering not so much her words as certain inflections of her voice and a certain bewildered look in her eyes i must go about it prudently that night he concluded addressing his cat which never having seen a woman before had fled at the arrival of madame chanteloube and taken refuge under the bed but had now advanced almost grovelling to sniff the chair where she had sat come to think of it she is an old hand madame hyacinthe she would not have a meeting in a cafe nor in the street she scented from afar the assignation house or the hotel and though from the mere fact of my not inviting her here she could not doubt that i did not want to introduce her to my lodging she came here deliberately then this first denial come to think of it is only a fine farce if she were not seeking a liaison she would not have visited me no 
she wanted me to beg her to do what she wanted to do like all women she wanted me to offer her what she desired i have been rolled her arrival has knocked the props out from under my whole method but what does it matter she is no less desirable he concluded happy to get rid of disagreeable reflections and plunge back into the delirious vision which he retained of her that night won't be exactly dreary he thought seeing again her eyes imagining them in surrender deceptive and plaintive as he would disrobe her and make a body white and slender warm and supple emerge from her tight skirt she has no children that is an earnest promise that her flesh is quite firm even at thirty a whole draught of youth intoxicated him durtal astonished took a look at himself in the mirror his tired eyes brightened his face seemed more youthful less worn lucky i had just shaved he said to himself but gradually as he mused he saw in this mirror which he was so little in the habit of consulting his features droop and his eyes lose their sparkle his stature which had seemed to increase in this spiritual upheaval diminished again sadness returned to his thoughtful mien i haven't what you would call the physique of a lady's man he concluded what does she see in me for she could very easily find someone else with whom to be unfaithful to her husband enough of these rambling thoughts let's cease to think them to sum up the situation i love her with my head and not my heart that's the important thing under such conditions whatever happens a love affair is brief and i am almost certain to get out of it without committing any follies End of chapter 8chapter nine of la bar by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain the next morning he woke thinking of her just as he had been doing when he went to sleep he tried to rationalize the episode and revolved his conjectures over and over once again he put himself this question why when i went to her house did she not let me see that i pleased her never a look never a word to encourage me why this correspondence when it was so easy to insist on having me to dine so simple to prepare an occasion which would bring us together either at her home or elsewhere and he answered himself it would have been usual and not at all diverting she is perhaps skilled in these matters she knows that the unknown frightens a man's reason away that the unembodied puts the soul in ferment and she wished to give me a fever before trying an attack to call her advances by their right name it must be admitted that if my conjectures are correct she is strangely astute at heart she is perhaps quite simply a crazy romantic or a comedian it amuses her to manufacture little adventures to throw tantalizing obstacles in the way of the realization of a vulgar desire and chanteloube he is probably aware of his wife's goings-on which perhaps facilitate his career otherwise how could she arrange to come here at nine o'clock at night instead of the morning or afternoon on pretence of going shopping to this new question there could be no answer and little by little he ceased to interrogate himself on the point he began to be obsessed by the real woman as he had been by the imaginary creature the latter had completely vanished he did not even remember her physiognomy now madame chanteloube just as she was in reality without borrowing the other's features had complete possession of him and fired his brain and senses to white heat he began to desire her madly and to wish furiously for tomorrow night and if she did not come he felt cold in the small of his back at the idea that she might be unable to get away from home or that she might wilfully stay away high time it was over and done with he said for this saint vitus's dance went on not without certain diminution of force which disturbed him in fact he feared after the febrile agitation of his nights to reveal himself as a sorry paladin when the time came but why bother he rejoined as he started towards carre's where he was to dine with the astrologer gevangy and des hermies i shall be rid of my obsession a while he murmured groping along in the darkness of the tower des hermies hearing him come up the stair opened the door casting a shaft of light into the spiral durtal reaching the landing saw his friend in shirt-sleeves and enveloped in an apron i am as you see in the heat of composition 
and upon a stew-pan boiling on the stove des hermies cast that brief and sure look which a mechanic gives his machine then he consulted as if it were a manometer his watch hanging to a nail look he said raising the pot lid durtal bent over and through a cloud of vapour he saw a coiled napkin rising and falling with the little billows where is the leg of mutton it my friend is sewn into that cloth so tightly that the air cannot enter it is cooking in this pretty singing sauce into which i have thrown a handful of hay some pods of garlic and slices of carrot and onion some grated nutmeg and laurel and thyme you will have many compliments to make me if gévingy doesn't keep us waiting too long because a gigot à l'anglaise won't stand being cooked to shreds Carré's wife looked in come in she said my husband is here durtal found him dusting the books they shook hands durtal at random looked over some of the dusted books lying on the table are these he asked technical works about metals and bell founding or are they about the liturgy of bells they are not about founding though there is sometimes reference to the founders the sainterers as they were called in the good old days you will discover here and there some details about alloys of red copper and fine tin you will even find i believe that the art of the sainterer has been in decline for three centuries probably due to the fact that the faithful no longer melt down their ornaments of precious metals thus modifying the alloy or is it because the founders no longer invoke saint anthony the eremite when the bronze is boiling in the furnace i do not know it is true at any rate that bells are now made in carload lots their voices are without personality they are all the same they're like docile and indifferent hired girls when formerly they were like those aged servants who became part of the family whose joys and griefs they have shared but what difference does that make to the clergy and the congregation at present these auxiliaries devoted to the cult do not represent any symbol and that explains the whole difficulty you asked me a few seconds ago whether these books treated of bells from the liturgical point of view yes most of them give tabulated explanations of the significance of the various component parts the interpretations are simple and offer little variety what are a few of them i can sum them all up for you in a very few words according to the rational of guillaume durand the hardness of the metal signifies the force of the preacher the percussion of the clapper on the sides expresses the idea that the preacher must first scourge himself to correct himself of his own vices before reproaching the vices of others the wooden frame represents the cross of christ and the cord which formerly served to set the bell swinging allegorizes the science of the scriptures which flows from the mystery of the cross itself the most ancient liturgists expound practically the same symbols jean Bellet, who lived in twelve hundred declares also that the bell is the image of the preacher but adds that its motion to and fro when it is set swinging teaches that the preacher must by turns elevate his language and bring it down within reach of the crowd for hugo of saint victor the clapper is the tongue of the officiating priest which strikes the two sides of the vase and announces thus at the same time the truth of the two testaments finally if we consult fortunatus amalarius perhaps the most ancient of the liturgists we find simply that the body of the bell denotes the mouth of the preacher and the hammer his tongue but said durtal somewhat disappointed it isn't what shall i say very profound the door opened why how are you said carre shaking hands with gévingy and then introducing him to durtal while the bell ringer's wife finished setting the table durtal examined the newcomer he was a little man wearing a soft black felt hat and wrapped up like an omnibus conductor in a cape with a military collar of blue cloth his head was like an egg with the hollow downward the skull waxed as if with cicatif seemed to have grown up out of the hair which was hard and like filaments of dried coconut and hung down over his neck the nose was bony and the nostrils opened like two hatchways over a toothless mouth which was hidden by a moustache grizzled like the goatee springing from the short chin at first glance one would have taken him for an art worker a wood engraver or a gilder of saints images but on looking at him more closely observing the eyes round and grey set close to the nose almost crossed and studying his solemn voice and obsequious manners one asked oneself from what quite special kind of sacristy the man had issued 
he took off his things and appeared in a black frock coat of square box-like cut a fine gold chain passed about his neck lost itself in the bulging pocket of an old vest durtal gasped when gévingy as soon as he had seated himself complacently put his hands on exhibition resting them on his knees enormous freckled with blotches of orange and terminating in milk-white nails cut to the quick the fingers were covered with huge rings the sets of which formed a phalanx seeing durtal's gaze fixed on his fingers he smiled you examine my valuables monsieur they are of three metals gold platinum and silver this ring bears a scorpion the sign under which i was born that with its two coupled triangles one pointing downward and the other upward reproduces the image of the macrocosm the seal of solomon the grand pantacle as for the little one you see here he went on showing a lady's ring set with a tiny sapphire between two roses that is a present from a person whose horoscope i was good enough to cast ah said durtal somewhat surprised at the man's self-satisfaction dinner is ready said the bell-ringer's wife des hermies doffing his apron appeared in his tight cheviot garments he was not so pale as usual his cheeks being red from the heat of the stove he set the chairs around Carré served the broth and every one was silent taking spoonfuls of the cooler broth at the edge of the bowl then madame brought des hermies the famous leg of mutton to cut it was a magnificent red and large drops flowed beneath the knife everybody ecstasized when tasting this robust meat aromatic with a puree of turnips sweetened with caper sauce des hermies bowed under a storm of compliments carre filled the glasses and somewhat confused in the presence of gévingy paid the astrologer effusive attention to make him forget their former ill feeling des hermies assisted in this good work and wishing also to be useful to durtal brought the conversation around to the subject of horoscopes then gévingy mounted the rostrum in a tone of satisfaction he spoke of his vast labours of the six months a horoscope required of the surprise of laymen when he declared that such work was not paid for by the price he asked five hundred francs but you see i cannot give my science for nothing he said and now people doubt astrology which was revered in antiquity also in the middle ages when it was almost sacred for instance monsieur look at the portal of notre dame the three doors which archaeologists not initiated into the symbolism of christianity and the occult designate by the names of the door of judgment the door of the virgin and the door of saint marcel or saint anne really represent mysticism astrology and alchemy the three great sciences of the middle ages today you find people who say are you quite sure that the stars have an influence on the destiny of man but monsieur without entering here into details reserved for the adept in what way is this spiritual influence stranger than that corporal influence which certain planets the moon for example exercise on the organs of men and women you are a physician monsieur des hermies and you are not unaware that doctors gillespin jackson and balfour of jamaica have established the influence of the constellations on human health in the west indies at every change of the moon the number of sick people augments the acute crises of fever coincide with the phases of our satellite finally there are lunatics go out in the country and ascertain at what periods madness becomes epidemic but does this serve to convince the incredulous he asked sorrowfully contemplating his rings it seems to me on the contrary that astrology is picking up said durtal there are now two astrologers casting horoscopes in the next column to the secret remedies on the fourth page of the newspapers and it's a shame those people don't even know the first thing about the science they are simply tricksters who hope thus to pick up some money what's the use of speaking of them when they don't even exist really it must be admitted that only in england and america is there anybody who knows how to establish the genethliac theme and to construct a horoscope i am very much afraid said de hermie that not only these so-called astrologers but also all the majors theosophists occultists and cabalists of the present day know absolutely nothing those with whom i am acquainted are indubitably incontestably ignorant imbeciles and that is the pure truth monsieur these people are for the most part down and out journalists or broken spendthrifts seeking to exploit the taste of a public weary of positivism they plagiarize eliphas levy steal from fabre d'olivet 
and write treatises of which they themselves are incapable of making head or tail it's a real pity when you come to think of it the more so as they discredit sciences which certainly contain verities omitted in their jumble said durtal then another lamentable thing said des hermies is that in addition to the dupes and simpletons these little sects harbour some frightful charlatans and windbags pieladon among others who does not know that shoddy mage commercialized to his finger-tips cried durtal oh yes that fellow briefly messieurs resumed gévingy all these people are incapable of obtaining in practice any effect whatever the only man in this century who without being either a saint or a diabolist has penetrated the mysteries is william crookes and as durtal who appeared to doubt the apparitions sworn to by this englishman declared that no theory could explain them gévingy perorated permit me messieurs we have the choice between two diverse and i venture to say very clear-cut doctrines either the apparition is formed by the fluid disengaged by the medium in trance to combine with the fluid of the persons present or else there are in the air immaterial beings elementals as they are called which manifest themselves under very nearly determinable conditions or else and this is the theory of pure spiritism the phenomena are produced by souls evoked from the dead i know it said durtal and that horrifies me i know also the hindu dogma of the migrations of souls after death these disembodied souls stray until they are reincarnated or until they attain from avatar to avatar to complete purity well i think it's quite enough to live once i'd prefer nothingness a hole in the ground to all those metamorphoses it's more consoling to me as for the evocation of the dead the mere thought that the butcher on the corner can force the soul of hugo balzac baudelaire to converse with him would put me beside myself if i believed it ah oh, no materialism abject as it is is less vile than that spiritism said carre is only a new name for the ancient necromancy condemned and cursed by the church gvingy looked at his rings then emptied his glass in any case he returned you will admit that these theories can be upheld especially that of the elementals which setting satanism aside seems the most veridic and certainly is the most clear space is peopled by microbes is it more surprising that space should also be crammed with spirits and larvae water and vinegar are alive with animalcules the microscope shows them to us now why should not the air inaccessible to the sight and to the instruments of man swarm like the other elements with beings more or less corporeal embryos more or less mature that is probably why cats suddenly look upward and gaze curiously into space at something that is passing and that we can't see said the bell-ringer's wife no thanks said gvingy to des hermies who was offering him another helping of egg and dandelion salad my friends said the bell-ringer you forget only one doctrine that of the church which attributes all these inexplicable phenomena to satan catholicism has known them for a long time it did not need to wait for the first manifestations of the spirits which were produced i believe in eighteen forty seven in the united states through the fox family before decreeing that spirit rapping came from the devil you will find in saint augustine the proof for he had to send a priest to put an end to noises and overturning of objects and furniture in the diocese of hippo analogous to those which spiritism points out at the time of theodoric also saint caesarius ridded a house of lemurs haunting it you see there are only the city of god and the city of the devil now since god is above these cheap manipulations the occultists and spiritists satanize more or less whether they wish to or not nevertheless spiritism has accomplished one important thing it has violated the threshold of the unknown broken the doors of the sanctuary it has brought about in the extranatural a revolution similar to that which was effected in the terrestrial order in france in seventeen eighty nine it has democratized evocation and opened a whole new vista only it has lacked initiates to lead it and proceeding at random without science it has agitated good and bad spirits together in spiritism you will find a jumble of everything it is the hash of mystery if i may be permitted the expression the saddest thing about it said des hermies laughing is that at a seance one never sees a thing i know that experiments have been successful but those which i have witnessed well the experimenters seemed to take a long shot and miss 
that is not surprising said the astrologer spreading some firm candied orange jelly on a piece of bread the first law to observe in magism and spiritism is to send away the unbelievers because very often their fluid is antagonistic to that of the clairvoyant or the medium then how can there be any assurance of the reality of the phenomena thought durtal carhet rose i shall be back in ten minutes he put on his greatcoat and soon the sound of his steps was lost in the tower true murmured durtal consulting his watch it's a quarter to eight there was a moment of silence in the room as all refused to have any more dessert madame carhet took up the tablecloth and spread an oilcloth in its place the astrologer played with his rings turning them about durtal was rolling a pellet of crumbled bread between his fingers des hermies leaning over to one side pulled from his patch pocket his embossed japanese pouch and made a cigarette then when the bell-ringer's wife had bidden them good-night and retired to her room des hermies got the kettle and the coffee-pot want any help durtal proposed you can get the little glasses and uncork the liqueur bottles if you will as he opened the cupboard durtal swayed dizzy from the strokes of the bells which shook the walls and filled the room with clamour if there are spirits in this room they must be getting knocked to pieces he said setting the liqueur glasses on the table bells drive phantoms and spectres away gevingy answered doctorally filling his pipe here said des hermies will you pour hot water slowly into the filter i've got to feed the stove it's getting chilly here my feet are freezing Carré returned blowing out his lantern the bell was in good voice this clear dry night and he took off his mountaineer cap and his overcoat what do you think of him des hermies asked durtal in a very low voice and pointed at the astrologer now lost in a cloud of pipe smoke in repose he looks like an old owl and when he speaks he makes me think of a melancholy and discursive schoolmaster only one said des hermies to carhet who was holding a lump of sugar over des hermies coffee cup i hear monsieur that you are occupied with the history of gilles de Ray, said gévingy to durtal yes for the time being i am up to my eyes in satanism with that man and said des hermies we were just going to appeal to your extensive knowledge you only can enlighten my friend on one of the most obscure questions of diabolism which one that of incubacy and succubacy gévingy did not answer at once that is a much graver question than spiritism he said at last and grave in a different way but monsieur already knows something about it only that opinions differ del rio and baudin for instance consider the incubi as masculine demons which couple with women and the succubi as demons who consummate the carnal act with men according to their theories the incubi take the semen lost by men in dream and make use of it so that two questions arise first can a child be born of such a union the possibility of this kind of procreation has been upheld by the church doctors who affirm even that children of such commerce are heavier than others and can drain three nurses without taking on flesh the second question is whether the demon who copulates with the mother or the man whose semen has been taken is the father of the child to which st thomas answers with more or less subtle arguments that the real father is not the incubus but the man for sinistrari d'ameno observed durtal the incubi and succubi are not precisely demons but animal spirits intermediate between the demon and the angel a sort of satyr or fawn such as were revered in the time of paganism a sort of imp such as were exorcised in the middle ages sinistrari adds that they do not need to pollute a sleeping man since they possess genitals and are endowed with prolificacy well there is nothing further said gévingy Goeres, so learned so precise in his mystic passes rapidly over this question even neglects it and the church you know is completely silent for the church does not like to treat this subject and views askance the priest who does occupy himself with it i beg your pardon said carre always ready to defend the church the church has never hesitated to declare itself on this detestable subject the existence of succubi and incubi is certified by saint augustine saint thomas saint bonaventure denise le chartreux pope innocent the eighth and how many others the question is resolutely settled for every catholic it also figures in the lives of some of the saints if i am not mistaken yes in the legend of saint hippolyte 
jacques de voragine tells how a priest tempted by a naked succubus cast his stole at its head and it suddenly became the corpse of some dead woman whom the devil had animated to seduce him yes said gévingy whose eyes twinkled the church recognizes succubacy i grant but let me speak and you will see that my observations are not uncalled for you know very well messieurs addressing des hermies and durtal what the books teach but within a hundred years everything has changed and if the facts i am going to reveal to you are perfectly known to the papal curia they are unknown to the many members of the clergy and you will not find them cited in any book whatever at present it is less frequently demons than bodies raised from the dead which fill the indispensable role of incubus and succubus in other words formerly the living being subject to succubacy was known to be possessed now that vampirism by the evocation of the dead is joined to demonism the victim is worse than possessed the church did not know what to do either it must keep silent or reveal the possibility of the evocation of the dead already forbidden by moses and this admission was dangerous for it popularized the knowledge of acts that are easier to produce now than formerly since without knowing it spiritism has traced the way so the church has kept silent and rome is not unaware of the frightful advance incubacy has made in the cloisters in our days that proves that continence is hard to bear in solitude said des hermies it merely proves that the soul is feeble and that people have forgotten how to pray said Carré however that may be messieurs to instruct you completely in this matter i must divide the creatures smitten with incubacy or succubacy into two classes the first is composed of persons who have directly and voluntarily given themselves over to the demoniac action of the spirits these persons are quite rare and they all die by suicide or some other form of violent death the second is composed of persons on whom the visitation of spirits has been imposed by a spell these are very numerous especially in the convents dominated by the demoniac societies ordinarily these victims end in madness the psychopathic hospitals are crowded with them the doctors and the majority of the priests do not know the cause of their madness but the cases are curable a thaumaturge of my acquaintance has saved a good many of the bewitched who without his aid would be howling under hydrotherapeutic douches there are certain fumigations certain exsufflations certain commandments written on a sheet of virgin parchment thrice blessed and worn like an amulet which almost always succeed in delivering the patient i want to ask you said des hermies does a woman receive the visit of the incubus while she is asleep or while she is awake a distinction must be made if the woman is not the victim of a spell if she voluntarily consorts with the impure spirit she is always awake when the carnal act takes place if on the other hand the woman is the victim of sorcery the sin is committed either while she is asleep or while she is awake but in the latter case she is in a cataleptic state which prevents her from defending herself the most powerful of present-day exorcists the man who has gone most thoroughly into this matter one joannes doctor of theology told me that he had saved nuns who had been ridden without respite for two three even four days by incubi i know that priest remarked des hermies and the act is consummated in the same manner as the normal human act yes and no here the dirtiness of the details makes me hesitate said gévingy becoming slightly red what i can tell you is more than strange know then that the organ of the incubus is bifurcated and at the same time penetrates both vases formerly it extended and while one branch of the fork acted in the licit channels the other at the same time reached up to the lower part of the face you may imagine gentlemen how life must be shortened by operations which are multiplied through all the senses and you are sure that these are facts absolutely but come now you have proofs gévingy was silent then the subject is so grave and i have gone so far that i had better go the rest of the way i am not mad nor the victim of hallucination well messieurs i slept one time in the room of the most redoubtable master satanism can now claim canon d'ocre des hermies interposed yes and my sleep was fitful it was broad daylight i swear to you that the succubus came irritant and palpable and most tenacious happily i remembered the formula of deliverance which kept me so i ran that very day to dr joannes of whom i have spoken 
he immediately and forever i hope liberated me from the spell if i did not fear to be indiscreet i would ask you what kind of thing this succubus was whose attack you repulsed why it was like any naked woman said the astrologer hesitantly curious now if it had demanded its little gifts its little gloves said durtal biting his lips and do you know what has become of the terrible docre de hermie inquired no thank god they say he is in the south somewhere around nîmes where he formerly resided but what does this abbe do inquired durtal what does he do he evokes the devil and he feeds white mice on the hosts which he consecrates his frenzy for sacrilege is such that he had the image of christ tattooed on his heels so that he could always step on the saviour well murmured carre whose militant moustache bristled while his great eyes flamed if that abominable priest were here i swear to you that i would respect his feet but that i would throw him downstairs head first and the black mass inquired de hermie he celebrates it with foul men and women he is openly accused of having influenced people to make wills in his favour and of causing inexplicable death unfortunately there are no laws to repress sacrilege and how can you prosecute a man who sends maladies from a distance and kills slowly in such a way that at the autopsy no traces of poison appear the modern gilles de Rey, exclaimed durtal yes less savage less frank more hypocritically cruel he does not cut throats he probably limits himself to sendings or to causing suicide by suggestion said de hermie for he is i believe a master hypnotist could he insinuate into a victim the idea to drink regularly in graduated doses a toxin which he would designate and which would simulate the phases of a malady asked durtal nothing simpler open window burglars that the physicians of the present day are they recognize perfectly the ability of a more skilful man to pull off such jobs the experiments of bonny liegeois liebeau and bernheim are conclusive you can even get a person assassinated by another to whom you suggest without his knowledge the will to the crime i was thinking of something myself said carre who had been reflecting and not listening to this discussion of hypnotism of the inquisition it certainly had its reason for being it is the only agent that could deal with this fallen priest whom the church has swept out and remember said de hermie with his crooked smile playing around the corner of his mouth that the ferocity of the inquisition has been greatly exaggerated no doubt the benevolent baudin speaks of driving long needles between the nails and the flesh of the sorcerer's fingers an excellent gehenna says he he eulogizes equally the torture by fire which he characterizes as an exquisite death but he wishes only to turn the magicians away from their detestable practices and save their souls then del rio declares that the question must not be applied to demoniacs after they have eaten for fear they will vomit he worried about their stomachs this worthy man wasn't it also he who decreed that the torture must not be repeated twice in the same day so as to give fear and pain a chance to calm down admit that the good jesuit was not devoid of delicacy docre gévingy went on not paying any attention to the words of de hermie is the only individual who has rediscovered the ancient secrets and who obtains results in practice he is rather more powerful i would have you believe than all those fools and quacks of whom we have been speaking and they know the terrible canon for he has sent many of them serious attacks of ophthalmia which the oculists cannot cure so they tremble when the name docre is pronounced in their presence but how did a priest fall so low i can't say if you wish ampler information about him said gévingy addressing des hermies question your friend chantelouve chantelouve cried durtal yes he and his wife used to be quite intimate with canon d'ocre but i hope for their sakes that they have long since ceased to have dealings with the monster durtal listened no more madame chantelouve knew canon d'ocre oh, was she satanic too no she certainly did not act like a possessed surely this astrologer is cracked he thought she and he called her image before him and thought that to-morrow night she would probably give herself to him ah those strange eyes of hers those dark clouds suddenly cloven by radiant light she came now and took complete possession of him as before he had descended to the tower but if i didn't love you would i have come to you 
that sentence which she had spoken with a caressing inflection of the voice he heard again and again he saw her mocking and tender face ah you are dreaming said the hermie tapping him on the shoulder we have to go it's striking ten when they were in the street they said good night to givenchy who lived on the other side of the river then they walked along a little way well said the hermie are you interested in my astrologer he is slightly mad isn't he slightly hm. well his stories are incredible everything is incredible said de hermie placidly turning up the collar of his overcoat however i will admit that givenchy astounds me when he asserts that he was visited by a succubus his good faith is not to be doubted for i know him to be a man who means what he says though he is vain and doctorial i know too that at la salpetriere such occurrences are not rare women smitten with hysteroepilepsy see phantoms beside them in broad daylight and mate with them in a cataleptic state and every night couch with visions that must be exactly like the fluid creatures of incubacy but these women are hysteroepileptics and givenchy isn't for i am his physician then what can be believed and what can be proved the materialists have taken the trouble to revise the accounts of the sorcery trials of old they have found in the possession cases of the ursulines of loudin and the nuns of Boitiers, in the history even of the convulsionists of saint medard the symptoms of major hysteria the same contractions of the whole system the same muscular dissolutions the same lethargies even finally the famous arc of the circle and what does this demonstrate that these demonomaniacs were hysteroepileptics certainly the observations of dr richet expert in such matters are conclusive but wherein do they invalidate possession from the fact that the patients of la salpetriere are not possessed though they are hysterical does it follow that others smitten with the same malady as they are not possessed it would have to be demonstrated also that all demonopathics are hysterical and that is false for there are women of sound mind and perfectly good sense who are demonopathic without knowing it and admitting that the last point is controvertible there remains this unanswerable question is a woman possessed because she is hysterical or is she hysterical because she is possessed only the church can answer science cannot no come to think it over the effrontery of the positivists is appalling they decree that satanism does not exist they lay everything at the account of major hysteria and they don't even know what this frightful malady is and what are its causes no doubt charcot determines very well the phases of the attack notes the nonsensical and passional attitudes the contortionistic movements he discovers hysterogenic zones and can by skilfully manipulating the ovaries arrest or accelerate the crises but as for foreseeing them and learning the sources and the motives and curing them that's another thing science goes all to pieces on the question of this inexplicable stupefying malady which consequently is subject to the most diversified interpretations not one of which can be declared exact for the soul enters into this the soul in conflict with the body the soul overthrown in the demoralization of the nerves you see old man all this is as dark as a bottle of ink mystery is everywhere and reason cannot see its way hmm said durtal who is now in front of his door since anything can be maintained and nothing is certain succubacy has it basically it is more literary and cleaner than positivism End of chapter 9chapter ten of la barre by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain the day was long and hard to kill waking at dawn full of thoughts of madame chanteloube he could not stay in one place and kept inventing excuses for going out he had no cakes bonbons and exotic liqueurs and one must not be without all the little essentials when expecting a visit from a woman he went by the longest route to the avenue de l'opera to buy fine essences of cedar and of that alkermes which makes the person tasting it think he is in an oriental pharmaceutic laboratory the idea is he said not so much to treat hyacinthe as to astound her by giving her a sip of an unknown elixir he came back laden with packages then went out again and in the street was assailed by an immense ennui after an interminable tour of the quays he finally tumbled into a beer hall he fell on a bench and opened a newspaper 
what was he thinking as he sat not reading but just looking at the police news nothing not even of her from having revolved the same matter over and over again and again his mind had reached a deadlock and refused to function durtal merely found himself very tired very drowsy as one in a warm bath after a night of travel i must go home pretty soon he said when he could collect himself a little for pere rateau certainly has not cleaned house in the thorough fashion which i commanded and of course i don't want the furniture to be covered with dust six o'clock suppose i dine after a fashion in some not too unreliable place he remembered a nearby restaurant where he had eaten before without a great deal of dread he chewed his way laboriously through an extremely dead fish then through a piece of meat flabby and cold then he found a very few lentils stiff with insecticide beneath a great deal of sauce finally he savoured some ancient prunes whose juice smelt of mould and was at the same time aquatic and sepulchral back in his apartment he lighted fires in his bedroom and in his study then he inspected everything he was not mistaken the concierge had upset the place with the same brutality the same haste as customarily however he must have tried to wash the windows because the glass was streaked with finger marks durtal effaced the imprints with a damp cloth smoothed out the folds in the carpet drew the curtains and put the bookcases in order after dusting them with a napkin everywhere he found grains of tobacco trodden cigarette ashes pencil sharpenings pen points eaten with rust he also found cocoons of cat fur and crumpled bits of rough draught manuscript which had been whirled into all corners by furious sweeping he finally could not help asking himself why he had so long tolerated the fuzzy filth which obscured and encrusted his household while he dusted his indignation against rateau increased mightily look at that he said perceiving his wax candles grown as yellow as tallow ones he changed them that's better he arranged his desk into studied disarray notebooks and books with paper cutters in them for bookmarks he laid in careful disorder symbol of work he said smiling as he placed an old folio open on a chair then he passed into his bedroom with a wet sponge he freshened up the marble of the dresser then he smoothed the bed cover straightened his photographs and engravings and went into the bathroom here he paused disheartened in a bamboo rack over the washbowl there was a chaos of files resolutely he grabbed the perfume bottles scoured the bottoms and necks with emery rubbed the labels with gum elastic and bread crumbs then he soaped the tub dipped the combs and brushes in an ammoniac solution got his vaporizer to working and sprayed the room with persian lilac washed the linoleum and scoured the seat and the pipes seized with a mania for cleanliness he polished scrubbed scraped moistened and dried with great sweeping strokes of the arm he was no longer vexed at the concierge he was even sorry the old villain had not left him more to do then he shaved touched up his moustache and proceeded to make an elaborate toilet asking himself as he dressed whether he had better wear button shoes or slippers he decided that shoes were less familiar and more dignified but resolved to wear a flowing tie and a blouse thinking that this artistic negligee would please a woman already he said after a last stroke of the brush he made the turn of the other rooms poked the fires and fed the cat which was running about in alarm sniffing all the cleaned objects and doubtless thinking that those he rubbed against every day without paying any attention to them had been replaced by new ones oh the little essentials i'm forgetting durtal put the tea-kettle on the hob and placed cups teapot sugar bowl cakes bonbons and tiny liqueur glasses on an old lacquered waiter so as to have everything on hand when it was time to serve now i'm through i've given the place a thorough cleaning let her come he said to himself realigning some books whose backs stuck out further than the others on the shelves everything in good shape except the chimney of the lamp where it bulges there are caramel specks and blobs of soot but i can't get the thing out i don't want to burn my fingers and anyway with the shade lowered a bit she won't notice well how shall i proceed when she does come he asked himself sinking into an armchair she enters good i take her hands i kiss them then i bring her into this room i have her sit down beside the fire in this chair i station myself facing her on this stool 
advancing a little touching her knees i can seize her i make her bend over i am supporting her whole weight i bring her lips to mine and i am saved or rather lost for then the bother begins i can't bear to think of getting her into the bedroom undressing and going to bed that part is appalling unless you know each other very well and when you are just becoming acquainted the nice way is to have a cosy little supper for two the wine has an ungodly kick to it she immediately passes out and when she comes to she is lying in bed under a shower of kisses as we can't do it that way we shall have to avoid mutual embarrassment by making a show of passion if i speed up the tempo and pretend to be in a frenzy perhaps we shall not have time to think about the miserable details so i must possess her here in this very spot and she must think i have lost my head when she succumbs it's hard to arrange in this room because there isn't any divan the best way would be to throw her down on the carpet she could put her hands over her eyes as they always do i shall take good care to turn down the lamp before she rises well i had better prepare a cushion for her head he found one and slid it under the chair and i had better not wear suspenders for they often cause ridiculous delays he took them off and put on a belt but then there is that damned question of the skirts i admire the novelists who can get a virgin unharnessed from her corsets and deflowered in the winking of an eye as if it were possible how annoying to have to fight one's way through all those starched entanglements i do hope madame chanteloube will be considerate and avoid those ridiculous difficulties as much as possible for her own sake he consulted his watch half past eight i mustn't expect her for nearly an hour because like all women she will come late what kind of an excuse will she make to chanteloube to get away tonight well that is none of my business hmm. this water heater beside the fire looks like the invitation to the toilet but no the tea things handy banish any gross idea and if hyacinthe did not come she will come he said to himself suddenly moved what motive would she have for staying away she knows that she cannot inflame me more than i am inflamed then jumping from phase to phase of the same old question this will turn out badly of course he decided once i am satisfied disenchantment is inevitable oh well so much the better for with this romance going on i cannot work miserable me relapsing only in mind alas to the age of twenty i am waiting for a woman i who have scorned the doings of lovers for years and years i look at my watch every five minutes and i listen in spite of myself thinking it is her step i hear on the stair no there is no getting around it the little blue flower the perennial of the soul is difficult to extirpate and it keeps growing up again it does not show itself for twenty years and then all of a sudden you know not why nor how it sprouts and then forth comes a burst of blossoms my god i am getting foolish he jumped from his chair there was a gentle ring not nine o'clock yet it isn't she he murmured opening the door he squeezed her hands and thanked her for being so punctual she said she was not feeling well i came only because i didn't want to keep you waiting in vain his heart sank i have a fearful headache she said passing her gloved hands over her forehead he took her furs and motioned her to the armchair prepared to follow his plan of attack he sat down on the stool but she refused the armchair and took a seat beside the table rising he bent over her and caught hold of her fingers your hand is burning she said yes a bit of a fever because i get so little sleep if you knew how much i have thought about you now i have you here all to myself and he spoke of that persistent odour of cinnamon faint distant expiring amid the less definite odours which her gloves exhaled well and he sniffed her fingers you will leave some of yourself here when you go away she rose sighing i see you have a cat what is his name mouche she called to the cat which fled precipitately mouche mouche durtal called but mouche took refuge under the bed and refused to come out you see he is rather bashful 
he has never seen a woman oh would you try to make me think you have never received a woman here he swore that he never had that she was the first and you were not really anxious that this first should come he blushed why do you say that she made a vague gesture i want to tease you she said sitting down in the armchair to tell you the truth i do not know why i like to ask you such presumptuous questions he had sat down in front of her so now at last the scene was set as he wished and he must begin the attack his knee touched hers you know he said that you cannot presume here you have claims on no i haven't and i want none why because listen and her voice became grave and firm the more i reflect the more inclined i am to ask you for heaven's sake not to destroy our dream and then do you want me to be frank so frank that i shall doubtless seem a monster of selfishness well personally i do not wish to spoil the the what shall i say the extreme happiness our relation gives me i know i explain badly and confusedly but this is the way it is i possess you when and how i please just as for a long time i have possessed byron baudelaire gerard de nerval those i love you mean that i have only to desire them to desire you before i go to sleep and and you would be inferior to my chimera to the durtal i adore whose caresses make my nights delirious he looked at her in stupefaction she had that dolent troubled look in her eyes she even seemed not to see him but to be looking into space he hesitated in a sudden flash of thought he saw the scenes of incubacy of which gévingy had spoken we shall untangle all this later he thought within himself meanwhile he took her gently by the arms drew her to him and abruptly kissed her mouth she rebounded as if she had had an electric shock she struggled to rise he strained her to him and embraced her furiously then with a strange gurgling cry she threw her head back and caught his leg between both of hers he emitted a howl of rage for he felt her haunches move he understood now or thought he understood she wanted a miserly pleasure a sort of solitary vice he pushed her away she remained there quite pale choking her eyes closed her hands outstretched like those of a frightened child then durtal's wrath vanished with a little cry he came up to her and caught her again but she struggled crying no i beseech you let me go he held her crushed against his body and attempted to make her yield i implore you let me go her accent was so despairing that he relinquished her then he debated with himself whether to throw her brutally on the floor and violate her but her bewildered eyes frightened him she was panting and her arms hung limp at her sides as she leaned very pale against the bookcase ah he said marching up and down knocking into the furniture i must really love you if in spite of your supplications and refusals she joined her hands to keep him away good god he said exasperated what are you made of she came to herself and offended she said to him monsieur i too suffer spare me and pell-mell she spoke of her husband of her confessor and became so incoherent that durtal was frightened she was silent then in a singing voice she said tell me you will come to my house to-morrow night won't you but i suffer too she seemed not to hear him in her smoky eyes far far back there seemed to be a twinkle of feeble light she murmured in the cadence of a canticle tell me dear you will come to-morrow night won't you yes he said at last then she readjusted herself and without saying a word quitted the room in silence he accompanied her to the entrance she opened the door turned around took his hand and very lightly brushed it with her lips he stood there stupidly not knowing what to make of her behavior what does she mean he exclaimed returning to the room putting the furniture back in place and smoothing the disordered carpet heavens i wish i could as easily restore order to my brain let me think if i can what is she after because of course she has something in view she does not want our relation to culminate in the act itself does she really fear disillusion as she claims 
is she really thinking how grotesque the amorous somersaults are or is she as i believe a melancholy and terrible player around the edges thinking only of herself well her obscene selfishness is one of those complicated sins that have to be shriven by the very highest confessor she's a plain teaser i don't know incubacy enters into this she admits so placidly that in dream she cohabits at will with dead or living beings is she satanizing and is this some of the work of canon docre he's a friend of hers so many riddles impossible to solve what is the meaning of this unexpected invitation for tomorrow night does she wish to yield nowhere except in her own home does she feel more at ease there or does she think the propinquity of her husband will render the sin more piquant does she loathe chanteloup and is this a meditated vengeance or does she count on the fear of danger to spur our senses after all i think it is probably a final coquetry an appetizer before the repast and women are so funny anyway she probably thinks these delays and subterfuges are necessary to differentiate her from a cocotte or perhaps there is a physical necessity for stalling me off another day he sought other reasons but could find none deep down in my heart he said vexed in spite of himself by this rebuff i know i have been an imbecile i ought to have acted the caveman and paid no attention to her supplications and lies i ought to have taken violent possession of her lips and breast then it would be finished whereas now i must begin at the beginning again and god damn her i have other things to do who knows whether she isn't laughing at me this very moment perhaps she wanted me to be more violent and bold but no her soul-sick voice was not feigned her poor eyes did not simulate bewilderment and then what would she have meant by that respectful kiss for there was an impalpable shade of respect and gratitude in that kiss which she planted on my hand she was too much for him meanwhile in this hurly-burly i have forgotten my refreshments suppose i take off my shoes now that i am alone for my feet are swollen from parading up and down the room suppose i do better yet and go to bed for i am incapable of working or reading and he drew back the covers decidedly nothing happens the way one foresees it yet my plan of attack wasn't badly thought out he said crawling in with a sigh he blew out the lamp and the cat reassured passed over him lighter than a breath and curled up without a sound End of chapter 10contrary to his expectations he slept all night with clenched fists and woke next morning quite calm even gay the scene of the night before which ought to have exacerbated his senses produced exactly the opposite effect the truth is that durtal was not one of those who were attracted by difficulties he always made one hardy effort to surmount them then when that failed he would withdraw with no desire to renew the combat if madame chanteloup thought to entice him by delays she had miscalculated this morning already he was weary of the comedy his reflections began to be slightly tinged with bitterness he was angry at the woman for having wished to keep him in suspense and he was angry at himself for having permitted her to make a fool of him then certain expressions the impertinence of which had not struck him at first chilled him now her nervous trick of laughing which sometimes caught her in public places then her declaration that she did not need his permission nor even his person in order to possess him seemed to him unbecoming to say the least and uncalled for as he had not run after her nor indeed made any advances to her at all i will fix you he said when i get some hold over you but in the calm awakening of this morning the spell of the woman had relaxed resolutely he thought keep two dates with her this one tonight at her house it won't count because nothing can be done for i intend neither to allow myself to be assaulted nor to attempt an assault i certainly have no desire to be caught by chanteloup in flagrante delicto and probably get into a shooting scrape and be hailed into police court have her here once if she does not yield then why the matter is closed she can go and tickle somebody else and he made a hearty breakfast and sat down to his writing table and ran over the scattered notes for his book i had got he said glancing at his last chapter 
to where the alchemic experiments and diabolic evocations have proved unavailing prelati blanchet all the sorcerers and sorcerers helpers whom the marshal has about him admit that to bring satan to him gilles must make over his soul and body to the devil or commit crimes gilles refuses to alienate his existence and sell his soul but he contemplates murder without any horror this man so brave on the battlefield so courageous when he accompanied jeanne d'arc trembles before the devil and is afraid when he thinks of eternity and of christ the same is true of his accomplices he has made them swear on the testament to keep the secret of the confounding turpitudes which the chateau conceals and he can be sure that not one will violate the oath for in the middle ages the most reckless of freebooters would not commit the inexpiable sin of deceiving god at the same time that his alchemists abandon their unfruitful furnaces gilles begins a course of systematic gluttony and his flesh set on fire by the essences of inordinate potations and spiced dishes seethes in tumultuous eruption now there are no women in the chateau gilles appears to have despised the sex ever since leaving the court after experience of the ribalds of the camps and frequentation with Antraille and la Hire of the prostitutes of charles the seventh it seems that a dislike for the feminine form came over him like others whose ideal of concupiscence is deteriorated and deviated he certainly comes to be disgusted by the delicacy of the grain of the skin of women and by that odour of femininity which all sodomists abhor he depraves the choir boys who are under his authority he chose them in the first place these little sultry ministrants for their beauty and beautiful as angels they are they are the only ones he loves the only ones he spares in his murderous transports but soon infantile pollution seems to him an insipid delicacy the law of satanism which demands that the elect of evil once started must go the whole way is once more fulfilled gilles's soul must become thoroughly cankered a red tabernacle that in it the very low may dwell at ease the litanies of lust arise in an atmosphere that is like the wind over a slaughter-house the first victim is a very small boy whose name we do not know gilles disembowels him and cutting off the hands and tearing out the eyes and heart carries these members into prelati's chamber the two men offer them with passionate objurgations to the devil who holds his peace gilles confounded flees prelati rolls up the poor remains in linen and trembling goes out at night to bury them in consecrated ground beside a chapel dedicated to saint vincent gilles preserves the blood of this child to write formulas of evocation and conjurements it manures a horrible crop not long afterward the marshal reaps the most abundant harvest of crimes that has ever been sown from fourteen thirty two to fourteen forty that is to say during the eight years between the marshal's retreat and his death the inhabitants of anjou poitou and Brittany walk the highways wringing their hands all the children disappear shepherd boys are abducted from the fields little girls coming out of school little boys who have gone to play ball in the lanes or at the edge of the wood return no more in the course of an investigation ordered by the duke of Brittany, the scribes of jean touche duke's commissioner in these matters compile interminable lists of lost children lost at la roche bernard the child of the woman Peronne a child who did go to school and did apply himself to his book with exceeding diligence lost at saint etienne de montluc the son of guillaume brice and this was a poor man and sought arms lost at machecoul the son of georges le barbier who was seen a certain day knocking apples from a tree behind the hotel rondeau and who since hath not been seen lost at tonnay the child of matelin Touard and he had been heard to cry and lament and the said child was about twelve years of age at marchecoul again the day of pentecost mother and father sergent leave their eight-year-old boy at home and when they return from the fields they did not find the said child of eight years of age wherefore they marvelled and were exceeding grieved at chanteloup it is pierre badieu mercer of the parish who says that a year or thereabouts ago he saw in the domaine de Ray two little children of the age of nine who were brothers and the children of robin bravo of the aforesaid place and since that time neither have they been seen neither doth any know what hath become of them 
at nantes it is jeanne d'arel who deposes that on the day of the feast of the holy father her true child named olivier did stray from her being of the age of seven and eight years and since the day of the feast of the holy father neither did she see him nor hear tidings and the account of the investigation goes on revealing hundreds of names describing the grief of the mothers who interrogate passers-by on the highway and telling of the keening of the families from whose very homes children have been spirited away when the elders went to the fields to hoe or to sow the hemp these phrases like a desolate refrain recur again and again at the end of every deposition they were seen complaining dolorously exceedingly they did lament wherever the bloodthirsty gilles dwells the women weep at first the frantic people tell themselves that evil fairies and malicious genii are dispersing the generation but little by little terrible suspicions are aroused as soon as the marshal quits a place as he goes from the chateau de tiffauges to the chateau de chantossé and from there to the castle of la Suze or to nantes he leaves behind him a wake of tears he traverses a countryside and in the morning children are missing trembling the peasant realizes also that wherever prelati roger de briqueville gilles de sillet any of the marshal's intimates have shown themselves little boys have disappeared finally the peasant learns to look with horror upon an old woman perrine martin who wanders around clad in grey her face covered as is that of gilles de sillet with a black stamen she accosts children and her speech is so seductive her face when she raises her veil so benign that all follow her to the edge of a wood where men carry them off gagged in sacks and the frightened people call this purveyor of flesh this ogress la meffrey from the name of a bird of prey these emissaries spread out covering all the villages and hamlets tracking the children down at the orders of the chief huntsman the sire de briqueville not content with these beaters gilles takes to standing at a window of the chateau and when young mendicants attracted by the renown of his bounty ask an arms he runs an appraising eye over them has any who excite his lust brought in and thrown in an underground prison and kept there until being in appetite he is pleased to order a carnal supper how many children did he disembowel after deflowering them he himself did not know so many were the rapes he had consummated and the murders he had committed the texts of the times enumerate between seven and eight hundred but the estimate is inaccurate and seems over conservative entire regions were devastated the hamlet of tiffauges had no more young men la Suze was without male posterity at chantossé the whole foundation room of a tower was filled with corpses a witness cited in the inquest guillaume hilaret declared also that one height du jardin hath heard say that there was found in the said castle a wine pipe full of dead little children even to-day traces of these assassinations linger two years ago at tiffauges a physician discovered an oubliette and brought forth piles of skulls and bones gilles confessed to frightful holocausts and his friends confirmed the atrocious details at dusk when their senses are phosphorescent enkindled by inflammatory spiced beverages and by high venison gilles and his friends retire to a distant chamber of the chateau the little boys are brought from their cellar prisons to this room they are disrobed and gagged the marshal fondles them and forces them then he hacks them to pieces with a dagger taking great pleasure in slowly dismembering them at other times he slashes the boy's chest and drinks the breath from the lungs sometimes he opens the stomach also smells it enlarges the incision with his hands and seats himself in it then while he macerates the warm entrails in mud he turns half around and looks over his shoulder to contemplate the supreme convulsions the last spasms he himself says afterwards i was happier in the enjoyment of tortures tears fright and blood than in any other pleasure then he becomes weary of these faecal joys an unpublished passage in his trial proceedings informs us that the said sire heated himself with little boys sometimes also with little girls with whom he had congress in the belly saying that he had more pleasure and less pain than acting in nature after which he slowly saws their throats cuts them to pieces and the corpses the linen and the clothing are put in the fireplace where a smudge fire of logs and leaves is burning and the ashes are thrown into the latrine or scattered to the winds from the top of a tower 
or buried in the moats and mounds soon his furies become aggravated until now he has appeased the rage of his senses with living or moribund beings he wearies of stuprating palpitant flesh and becomes a lover of the dead a passionate artist he kisses with cries of enthusiasm the well-made limbs of his victims he establishes sepulchral beauty contests and whichever of the truncated heads receives the prize he raises by the hair and passionately kisses the cold lips vampirism satisfies him for months he pollutes dead children appeasing the fever of his desires in the blood-smeared chill of the tomb he even goes so far one day when his supply of children is exhausted as to disembowel a pregnant woman and sport with the fetus after these excesses he falls into horrible states of coma similar to those heavy lethargies which overpowered sergeant bertrand after his violations of the grave but if that leaden sleep is one of the known phases of ordinary vampirism if gilles de ray was merely a sexual pervert we must admit that he distinguished himself from the most delirious sadists the most exquisite virtuosi in pain and murder by a detail which seems extra-human it is so horrible as these terrifying atrocities these monstrous outrages no longer suffice him he corrodes them with the essence of a rare sin it is no longer the resolute sagacious cruelty of the wild beast playing with the body of a victim his ferocity does not remain merely carnal it becomes spiritual he wishes to make the child suffer both in body and soul by a thoroughly satanic cheat he deceives gratitude dupes affection and desecrates love at a leap he passes the bounds of human infamy and lands plump in the darkest depth of evil he contrives this one of the unfortunate children is brought into his chamber and hanged by Bricqueville, Prelati, and de Sille to a hook fixed into the wall just at the moment when the child is suffocating gilles orders him to be taken down and the rope untied with some precaution he takes the child on his knees revives him caresses him rocks him dries his tears and pointing to the accomplices says these men are bad but you see they obey me do not be afraid i will save your life and take you back to your mother and while the little one wild with joy kisses him and at that moment loves him gilles gently makes an incision in the back of the neck rendering the child languishing to follow gilles own expression and when the head not quite detached bows gilles kneads the body turns it about and violates it bellowing after these abominable pastimes he may well believe that the art of the charnelist has beneath his fingers expressed its last drop of pus and in a vaunting cry he says to his troop of parasites there is no man on earth who dare do as i have done but if in love and well-doing the infinite is approachable for certain souls the out-of-the-world possibilities of evil are limited in his excesses of stupration and murder the marshal cannot go beyond a fixed point in vain he may dream of unique violations of more ingenious slow tortures but human imagination has a limit and he has already reached it even passed it with diabolic aid insatiable he seethes there is nothing material in which to express his ideal he can verify that axiom of demonographers that the evil one dupes all persons who give themselves or are willing to give themselves to him as he can descend no further he tries returning on the way by which he has come but now remorse overtakes him overwhelms him and wrenches him without respite his nights are nights of expiation besieged by phantoms he howls like a wounded beast he is found rushing along the solitary corridors of the chateau he weeps throws himself on his knees swears to god that he will do penance he promises to found pious institutions he does establish at machecoul a boy's academy in honour of the holy innocents he speaks of shutting himself up in a cloister of going to jerusalem begging his bread on the way but in this fickle and aberrated mind ideas superpose themselves on each other then pass away and those which disappear leave their shadow on those which follow abruptly even while weeping with distress he precipitates himself into new debauches and raving with delirium hurls himself upon the child brought to him gouges out the eyes runs his finger around the bloody milky socket then he seizes a spiked club and crushes the skull and while the gurgling blood runs over him he stands smeared with spattered brains and grinds his teeth and laughs like a hunted beast he flees into the wood 
while his henchmen remove the crimson stains from the ground and dispose prudently of the corpse and the reeking garments he wanders in the forests surrounding tiffauges dark impenetrable forests like those which Brittany still can show at carnoy he sobs as he walks along he attempts to thrust aside the phantoms which accost him then he looks about him and beholds obscenity in the shapes of the aged trees it seems that nature perverts itself before him that his very presence depraves it for the first time he understands the motionless lubricity of trees he discovers priapi in the branches here a tree appears to him as a living being standing on its root tressed head its limbs waving in the air and spread wide apart subdivided and resubdivided into haunches which again are divided and resubdivided here between two limbs another branch is jammed in a stationary fornication which is reproduced in diminished scale from bough to twig to the top of the tree there it seems the trunk is a phallus which mounts and disappears into a skirt of leaves or which on the contrary issues from a green clout and plunges into the glossy belly of the earth frightful images rise before him he sees the skin of little boys the lucid white skin vellum-like in the pale smooth bark of the slender beeches he recognizes the pachydermatous skin of the beggar boys in the dark and wrinkled envelope of the old oaks beside the bifurcations of the branches there are yawning holes puckered orifices in the bark simulating emunctoria or the protruding anus of a beast in the joints of the branches there are other visions elbows armpits furred with grey lichens even in the trunks there are incisions which spread out into great lips beneath tufts of brown velvety moss everywhere obscene forms rise from the ground and spring disordered into a firmament which satanizes the clouds swell into breasts divide into buttocks bulge as if with fecundity scattering a train of spawn through space they accord with the sombre bulging of the foliage in which now there are only images of giant or dwarf hips feminine triangles great v's mouths of sodom glowing cicatrices humid vents this landscape of abomination changes gilles now sees on the trunks frightful cancers and horrible winds he observes exostoses and ulcers membranous sores tubercular chancres atrocious caries it is an arboreal lazaret a venereal clinic and there at a detour of the forest isle stands a mottled red beech amid the sanguinary falling leaves he feels that he has been spattered by a shower of blood he goes into a rage he conceives the delusion that beneath the bark lives a wood nymph and he would feel with his hands the palpitant flesh of the goddess he would trucidate the dryad violate her in a place unknown to the follies of men he is jealous of the woodman who can murder can massacre the trees and he raves tensely he listens and hears in the soughing wind a response to his cries of desire overwhelmed he resumes his walk weeping until he arrives at the chateau and sinks to his bed exhausted an inert mass the phantoms take more definite shape now that he sleeps the lubric enlacements of the branches dilated crevices and cleft mosses the coupling of the diverse beings of the wood disappear the tears of the leaves whipped by the wind are dried the white abscesses of the clouds are resorbed into the grey of the sky and in an awful silence the incubi and succubi pass the corpses of his victims reduced to ashes and scattered return to the lava state and attack his lower parts he writhes with the blood bursting his veins he rebounds in a somersault then he crawls to the crucifix like a wolf on all fours and howling strains his lips to the feet of the christ a sudden reaction overwhelms him he trembles before the image whose convulsed face looks down on him he adjures christ to have pity supplicates him to spare a sinner and sobs and weeps and when incapable of further effort he whimpers he hears terrified in his own voice the lamentations of the children crying for their mothers and pleading for mercy and durtal coming slowly out of the vision he had conjured up closed his notebook and remarked rather petty my own spiritual conflict regarding a woman whose sin like my own to be sure is commonplace and bourgeois End of chapter 11